Not many CIOs are walking around with Emmys, but when you've had a career as broad as Sean Wechter, the fact that he and his teams have become Emmy winners is not all that surprising. From Dell to Comcast to USA Today to now as the CIO of Click, Sean has seen and done it all. On this episode of IT Visionaries, he walks us through some of his experiences and he explains the current state of data and what CIOs should be focusing on in their organizations. Enjoy this episode. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experience, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com platform. This podcast is created by the team at mission.org. Welcome to another episode of IT Visionaries. I'm Ian Fizan, Chief Content Officer here at mission.org. And we have on the other line in always sunny Philadelphia there. Sean, what's going on? Hey, how are you? It's a great day uh, to be talking about all things data literacy, which is a hot topic for a lot of our listeners. And we're going to get into your background. So first, how did you get into technology? Uh-huh. Yeah. So uh, when I graduated business school, uh, a friend of mine worked for Phillips Electronics. And so um, I, I always thought I'd end up down on Wall Street coming from New York. Uh, it, but I took a look at Phillips and you know, took the job and, and just fell in love. There's just so much technology. It was like a candy store uh, for somebody who, who loved technology, but w- wasn't really sure that that was going to be a career. Uh, and then uh, Philips owned Polygram Records. And so our, our team was creating CD-ROMs back in the day for music artists like Bon Jovi, Eric Clapton, Sheryl Crow. And then when the internet came around, we had all the digital assets. So we started creating websites for all these popular artists. Because of the popularity of the artists, we found ourselves in you know big websites and learning how to scale up on the fly and all that stuff. And ever since then, it's been off to the races. So from there, I went to uh, the Gartner Group up in Connecticut, and that was cool to sort of get an understanding of how to evaluate technology. And, you know, after that, went out to Silicon Valley, you know, the mecca for technology. Uh, It was just good to see in the dot-com boom uh, whether or not, you know, I could compete in in the heart of, you know, technology land. And then um, did a tour of duty at Dell in, in Austin, Texas. And just really seeing how a well-managed, hardcore technology company is run. Uh, And then joined Comcast to to run the Xfinity initiative and and, and digital media efforts, which then brought me to Click. Yeah, and tell me a little bit about your current role at Click. What what does the CIO do? What's the scope of your responsibilities? Yeah, so, uh, you know, think about it from a, you know, I wake up in the morning making sure that the business runs well and the employees are happy uh, for the most part. So that's all the enterprise systems, whether it's servers, network, databases, laptops, ERP, CRM, and so forth. Uh, And then now, because everything's moving to SaaS and subscription, it's are those systems powering our customer experience? And what does your team do? look like? How much time do they work on, you know, product versus, you know, in, internal employee experience? The team is split into, you know, some big categories. One is infrastructure, uh, and that's your classic food groups of, you know, internet, network, database, uh, laptops, servers, uh, cloud, all that stuff. And then there's business technology systems, which is ERP, CRM, marketing, and so forth. Uh, and then security team. I'd say about, of our time is spent on the enterprise side with 25 going into powering the customer experience. I want to go back to some of the earlier parts of your career. The team that you worked on won a couple Emmys. Can you tell us about that? You know, Emmys are just a byproduct of good teamwork and teams coming together and working together. Uh, And that doesn't happen overnight. So the first Emmy was won um, for the Xfinity user interface for the X1 cable system. And that was an an interesting project in that it it started four of us as a stealth project out in a secret office 
to reimagine the world's largest cable company. And it was completely cloud-based. Uh, and we just kind of went after it in a, you know, cloud-based, you know, container approach, service-oriented architecture, all of the modern approaches. Uh, and it was really interesting then to try to reintegrate effectively a startup back into a Fortune 500 company. Uh, and we did that, we did that well. And then over time, with the ability to iterate quickly, we won a, a fancy Emmy Award for the user interface, uh, the design team that did the second iteration of the X1 Xfinity interface uh, just crushed it and won an award for the UI. Uh, the second team that won an Emmy Award was for the remote control, the voice controlled remote control. And so uh, that's actually an interesting story in that that was the byproduct of a, an acquisition for a, a search company we bought in DC. It just didn't seem to really go anywhere. The acquisition, the technology was, you know, Kind of interesting, it kind of floundered for a while, and then three years later, that became a core feature, uh, and then an Emmy award-winning feature, and it just told me that, you know, you gotta give things time to, and you gotta be willing to invest in, in these acquisitions so that good things can, can, can spawn out of uh, those investments. And then most recently, um, King 5, which is the NBC station in Seattle, we did a, a website redesign for that website, and it won an Emmy award, which was pretty cool. I'm like, so I didn't realize that they had Emmys for this stuff. Pardon my ignorance here. This is really interesting. So yeah, yeah. could you actually go a little bit deeper on that? Because that's really fascinating. So just the way that you're delivering the content from, and these are all with Comcast. Is that right? Or the, the one for King 5 and NBC was with uh, Tegna, which is the largest uh, NBC affiliate station group uh, in the country. Oh, cool. uh, and so the, the, the secret <laughs> with, with Emmys also is, is that, you know, it's expensive to create a application package. Uh, and so you got to create a pretty, basically a commercial about your, wh whatever you're submitting, and then it gets evaluated. So it, that filters out a lot of technology. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's fun, it's good, but the awards are just byproducts, right? It just comes from teamwork and, you know, the, the, all people contributing. And so like I work with a guy who worked for uh, the, the Phillies and, in accounting and he's got a, a World Series ring. And I, I hear that, I see that and I say, yeah, of course he should. It's an entire organization. I always love, you know, we, we talked a bunch as a media company, I guess it's probably why, but when we talked to the former chief digital officer of, of Condé Nast, you know, I feel like media is such a tip of the spear for IT in a lot of ways because it's so visible and the mistakes are so visible and every second that you're down is dollars. You know, I know that it's that way for a lot of other places too, but. Holy cow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so I will tell you that, you know, Super Bowl weekend with the Xfinity platform in early days was an exercise in, you know, operational excellence and making sure nothing goes down and nothing fails. And then I think it was like one year they had a TV commercial. I think it was HP or somebody that had a the commercial was a joke as if there was an outage, a blank screen for 10 seconds. And my son saw me and saw my face, just like my heart skipped a beat when they did that because I'm like, oh, no. And then one year the power went out at the Super Bowl and it, things went dark. I'm thinking, oh, crap, did something fail? Uh, and it turns out it was just the power in the stadium went out. So, yes, I totally hear you there. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, you have to have backups to the backups. Uh, everything has to be done the right way. Was there something like, I, I feel like, you know, a lot of the CIOs of technology companies, you know, kind of where you are now, a lot of them never kind of had a media experience in IT. I almost feel like it could be like a, a CIO rotational program, right? Like you need to just sit, sit next to the CIO of a media company to see what kind of like, like those level of stresses are and then vice versa in the technology company or something. Oh my God, totally. Like there's, it's just been burned into my brain. You want three countermeasures for every core system and you want five resolvers for every core system. Uh, and so, you know, that's just been, I've learned that lesson the hard way. Uh, it actually, uh, early on at Philips Electronics, we launched, you learn the lesson of don't launch anything on Friday. So we had two websites that launched. One was a mapping site, which like a map quest early on. And the other was for a movie that Pamela Anderson was in called Barbed Wire. And so we were happy that we launched the, the, the movie Barbed Wire did terrible. Uh, so we thought, ah, oh, you know, like 
not really going to get a whole lot of traffic. And then we all go to the bar and we have a lot of fun. And then the pagers start going off back when they had pagers and the, the site's crashing. And we thought the mapping system, because it was big fancy algorithm spun out of control. Uh, and it turns out that Pamela Anderson such a global star that that site ended up getting tons of traffic and, and brought the servers, the sun servers back in the day to their knees and oh, then trying man. to get people out of a bar back to work so that they can you know, pick the site up was a, was a, was a lesson in don't ever do that again. Don't launch on Friday. That's, I love that. Don't launch it. We might have to pull that quote for the, uh, for the social card because <laughs> it's, it's a great lesson. I, you know, it's funny. It's like the exact opposite of in um, sports media. It's like you bury, you bury the, uh, the story on, you know, on Saturday morning so that there's the least amount of uh, people that are watching. But sometimes, yep. you know, Friday night can, you know, then your whole team is going to be working through the weekend. I always think about this with media because you're always on you know, it's something that we talk a lot about here at Mission. It's like, you know, media people just inherently work weirder hours. Was there anything like from a leadership perspective that when you were working there, you had to be really cognizant of with, uh, with your team? It comes from team and teamwork. Uh, and so the teams were really invested in what we were doing. Uh, and so, but you're, you're, you're totally right. I mean, election season, Super Bowl, like these are events. Now, the, the nice thing is, in the industry and, and especially technologists and operations people, they kind of understand that that's what's expected. What's changing is within the DevOps world and the AWS kind of says it the best. I think it's the learner. You build it, you run it. Uh, and that's changing in a world where, oh, it's not some ops team that has to pick things up or some level one. It's actually the team that built it that has to pick it up. And so that's causing heartburn with modern teams now where it's like, wait a second. I didn't sign up to do weekend work or evening work. Uh, and so that's changing. I, I like the idea of the essential tension of if you make something that's fragile, you feel the pain, then you're most incented to make sure that it's robust and standard. But I also am empathetic to the work-life balance, uh, that, that the, the impact that that happens. Ultimately, it creates a great feedback loop and think systems get stronger uh, in the end. When you were there, and I don't know if this is still the case, but um, I believe Comcast.net was a top 10 traffic site in the world. Is that right? Oh, yeah. I mean, that was when I, when I was, I was at Dell and I was looking at Comcast and think, no way, you know, America's most hated company. Uh, and then you start looking and just because of the size, you know, top 10 most traffic sites, top five most videos served on the internet at the time. Number six in search origination at the time. I remember thinking it's Comcast and search and just so big. And what that did from a technologist perspective, which was cool, was learning how to scale things and learning how to operate at scale. And so I just remember over and over and over again, all the vendor community would come in and say, yeah, we can handle scale. And it's like, <laughs> you think you can, but you can't. And so you know, I don't know if you remember back in the day when AOL used to point their homepage traffic at a site and it would always knock their site over. Yeah. It's kind of same, same with Comcast as well. We would, we, we got pretty good at metering things towards different systems and, and or driving traffic in different directions. Well, and then once, you know, over the years that you were there, streaming became the new normal. I'm curious, like, what was it like kind of early days of, uh, of the, the so-called streaming wars? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I remember uh, we were, uh, you know, Amy Bantz, who runs Comcast Ventures now, ran our division and she said, we're going we're gonna to stream HBO content on, online. And HBO is very protective of their content. And we had a security audit done by Merdan, which is a famous auditing company. And they came in and said, and I, you know, I had the data centers and they said, you're, you're, the cages in your data center are 12 feet high, but they need to be all the way up to the ceiling. You know, rip the cages out, put cages up to the ceiling. And then they gave us um, a, a hard drive of content and the key to the, con the hard drive and the hard drive itself, we had to walk them down in two separate people at separate times to basically make sure that that content was preserved and safe and all that stuff. So those, those are the early days where you actually took the hard drive and then you had people who would um, do the conversion into different file formats and then post them and all that stuff. Now, I mean, it's, it's far and wide and I, I kind of think it's pretty fragmented uh, and that it'll, it'll come back to a few hubs eventually just because you know, people don't want to spend $9 at 
so many different places for so many different subscriptions. Yeah, I know. It's like the, uh, there's a great article. I really need to look up who wrote this, but it's about bundling and unbundling of, yes. of services that basically disruption happens when products are unbundled and then bundled again. It's like the, it's like, you know, the product and then the platform and then product platform kind of same sort of idea. And yeah, that's the ultimate thing that happened with all these channels, right? We had 10 channels and then we had, you know, 150 and then we had a thousand. And then now our channels are Netflix is just a channel and, yeah. and we have, <laughs> and then, you know, Apple TV and, and, uh, and now Disney plus and, you know, all of that. I'm curious from a technology perspective, did you ever feel like as you were building this, that the way users were using the streaming service that you potentially just weren't really like meeting the bill? Like there just wasn't, there's just too much latency, not enough bandwidth. You know, I I feel like every night at between five and seven o'clock, like everybody's, or, you know, maybe it's a little bit later than that, seven to 10, everybody's streaming now and it slows down bandwidth and things like that. I'm just curious, like, what were some of the challenges as you were, as you were building, um, you know, the, uh, the Xfinity and, and Comcast platforms? Yeah, I give uh, Sam Schwartz and Shri Kote a lot of credit because when we first started, they said it's going to be completely cloud-based. So in, in Xfinity, every remote change is a round trip to the cloud. Uh, and so, you know, coming from internet land, you know that there's internet weather and that that could be, you know, there could be congestion and, and buffering and all that stuff. And so, but it was, it was, it was a good forward thinking technology bet that it ended up paying off because you can iterate at cloud speed and mobile speed. Look, in terms of experience for streaming, it's, pretty darn good. It's not where, it, you know, traditional, like if I'm going to watch the Super Bowl, uh, I'm going to watch it on a beautiful big screen TV with, with a cable system for sure. Uh, but my kids with their mobile devices, streaming YouTube and out and about and all that stuff, it's pretty darn good. And so uh, it's certainly coming together and converging. What do you think is next for, for streaming? I think there's consolidation. I think that it's going to, I think the, the amount of content available for everyone is you know, crazy abundant. And so the ability to, you know, have a Google like experience to search and discover content is going to be the, the next big step. Content quality, uh, you know, HD is nice for, you know, your, your, evening movie and that kind of stuff. But most of the consumption is happening uh, on other pieces of glass in, that you use, other consumption devices throughout your day. I think most of it's coming mobile anyway. So I just think, though, the ability to discover content, the YouTube experience where it's surfacing things that uh, are interesting to you, is, is you're going to see that in more places far and wide in different content sources. Working on the network side, I'm curious, like, what were the changes, you know, going from you know, working with TV stations across the country. Was there some sort of like, was there a mental shift when you took that role, leaving Comcast? Uh, so it was, that was interesting to be able to have uh, technology and product. And, you know, Comcast organized itself that way as well. So being able to step out of just technology and think about uh, be responsible for product as well, sort of was a mindset shift. Uh, and then also, you know, the, the products that media companies offer are delivered via social media, via apps, via websites, uh, and via television. And so thinking multi-screen was certainly a, a shift. Now, it's, it all ends up being content and images and video and audio, and that gets mixed up in different ways. From my perspective here, it's the thing that's tough with a lot of, you know, the way media has kind of been in the past was like it was actually kind of focused and then now it seems very unfocused. Like you think about like a magazine, it's like extremely mm -hmm. focused, right? You have the content, then you have the ad or, you know, whatever it is, you know, a newspaper, pretty focused. And now you see these websites and it's just the sprawl is like off the charts, right? There's just yeah, like yeah. stuff everywhere. There's pop-ups everywhere. You just have so you're inundated with so much stuff, which is I think why people are naturally going towards things like, you know, obviously podcasts, which is extremely streamlined. You have, you know, one stream of information, you know, you have things like individual, you know, some sure like Hulu and Netflix and, uh, and things like that, where it's just a single thing that you're, you're opting into. I'm curious, like, how did you manage 
creating digital products and it just fits into the app conversation to have a more streamlined approach to the technology that the user was using versus kind of like the kind of overwhelming stuff when you have so much content, you know, potentially available to show them. Yeah. So look, you know, you look in the app store and if you're not four, four and a half, five stars, you're, you're wasting your time. And so then it comes down to, okay, how do we create four, four and a half, five star products that people will want and use? So they have to be good and they have to be relevant and they have, they have to work. The the trick that you mentioned though, and with a lot of, companies that you see is the economic models are what drive sites to junk them up with all of this, you know, widgets and add-ons that slow them down and, you know, annoy users and all that stuff. So it's kind of a balance of trying to focus on speed, focus on customer's experience. And and to me, the answer ends up being, and it's just been a theme career-wise, is velocity and speed. And so you create feedback loops, And then if you have a team that it can execute quickly, you can incorporate that feedback and adjust. So when I think back to the uh, Xfinity journey or back at Philips, things that what what, what you start out with isn't anything near where you end up with. Uh, And you don't get to world-class products, world-class teams uh, without iterating really quickly. Now, fortunately in tech, that's normal to us. You know, Silicon Valley, that's par for the course. I mean, Netflix is famous for, you know, five, 6,000 releases per year. And so, you know, the iPhone releases are pretty current and frequent. And so being able to get into that battle rhythm that's quick is, is what's key. Did you feel like having that the amount of different, you know, apps and platforms and technologies that you were touching really helped you for kind of your next role as CIO? Because, you know, as you're talking to customers and as you're, you know, trying to figure out stuff internally, that, when you've seen so many different types of applications, technologies, platforms, that it kind of allows you to kind of pattern match across all of those? Oh, for sure. And, and, and the food groups don't really change in technology, whether you're applying them towards an enterprise or you're applying them towards consumers. Uh, in, in fact, consumers or businesses who are buying your product are a lot more honest with their feedback uh, and brutally honest uh, than employees and internal employees. And so I would say it's even a little easier focusing uh, on the enterprise side than it is with consumers and with customers, so to speak. So moving forward to your current role at Click, why were you excited to take the role? Oh, uh, really cool space. I've I've run uh, BI teams in my past prior companies. And so, you know, knowing that, you know, there are two industries that as far as I can see are just, you know, booming and growing. One is, you know, the data path and the other is security path. And so it's a pretty cool space. And then having come from Gartner, I know what it takes to be in the leader quadrant. It's hard. And looking at the companies and competitors in the leader quadrant, uh, seeing a company like Click be able to be in that leader quadrant for nine plus years told me that there was competitive DNA. Uh, And then being able to you know, build my chops in the data space was, was pretty attractive. Yeah. I actually, I want to ask you about Gardner for a second. Sure. So what were, what did you work on when you were there? Cause I know it was a little bit ago. Yeah. So uh, we, I worked on Salesforce automation uh, and then back in the day they called it push technology. And so there was like Marimba and being able to distribute software and alerts. And there was point cast, which was a pretty popular app at the time. And so, um, and then from that, morphed into the interactive media team at Gartner. uh, And then we did a um, product portfolio change. uh, I'll call it interesting uh, enough. It was called Gartner One at the time. And uh, it was just kind of reducing the bundling of the subscription of Gartner products at the time and creating sales configuration tools that you know, made it easier for salespeople to sell. And we implemented a configurator from Trilogy, which was an Austin-based company back in the day that was pretty hot. And so it was, it was cool. Yeah, it, it's funny. And the reason why I ask is because it seems like now, maybe more than ever, the role of analysts with just how much technology we have, the amount of vendors, the amount of, the amount of ways that you can market, the fact that those things are happening, it seems like you know, analysts are almost more important than ever. Because you need that confirmation in addition to 
you know, what your customers say about you. Um, and it seems like a lot of people are using that. Did, did it kind of feel that way back then or, or is it, is it, is it the same as it ever was or, or is it different? Now? It, it, it was more back then. Uh, I think now there's also the notion of there's the, you know, what Gartner's saying uh, and trying to get smart in different categories and, and, and the, the analysts help simplify things. But then there's also the notion of the innovative piece. And so in listening to podcasts like this, there are little nuggets and pearls that come out uh, that you say, ah, I got to go check out this other new product. And, and so getting, being able to take advantage of those other new things as they're popping up, the combination of the two is, is key. Okay. Sorry. So back, back to click. So as you kind of came into the role, what was your kind of first 90 days, uh, you know, on the job, new CIO, looking to make change, you know, busting heads. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a good team, good company. The company just, just went private. And so that was a transformative uh, event. I got to step in right at that moment, which was pretty cool and helped sort of take it from a public company to a private company. Uh, there was a big project that, uh, if I had it over to do again, I would have made changes. But as the new guy coming in, big project coming in for landing, it was 18 months in the works, people, you know, really struggling time-wise. And, and it was a, 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 a troubled initiative. And I should have known just, you know, 18-month project, big bang launch. Uh, I should have pulled the, the lever on it to say, hey, let's take another look at this. But because I was the new guy, I sort of let it roll. And then it ended up being just, a, you know, six months of rescue effort afterwards of, you know, cleaning up data and making sure, you know, salespeople aren't blocked and all that stuff. So it, it, uh, it was a big lesson learned there, but it was a good bonding experience for the team and a good, good way to transform the team to say, look, that wasn't fun. Let's go do it. The more modern agile, you know, things measured in two week sprints kind of thing. And so we, we, we went down the agile path and set up scrum teams and all that stuff. And so things are humming now, which is pretty cool. What's kind of the state of, of data and BI right now? Yeah, it's an exciting time. Uh, I mean, so we've got this initiative around data literacy, and I really believe in it. The notion of right now, if you can source data yourself, analyze it, and argue with it, you're going to kick the butt out of all your competitors and, <laughs> and other companies. And if you can't, you're just going to get left behind. It's just, it's one of those things where, you know, it used to be you'd create a BI team. Uh, they were a center of excellence. They'd publish a bunch of reports and people would be happy with those reports and or ask some questions and, and, and go and iterate. Now the game's changed where your knowledge workers have to be able to explore that data themselves. And that's what, that's what data literacy means to me, the ability to explore data uh, and the best example I have is, you know, we were on a call uh, with some, some of my team members and we were debating our um, you know, identity access management system and multi-factor authentication and whether it was a good thing, a bad thing and user experience and an engineer on the call just pulls up, click, grabs the log files, pulls in ServiceNow tickets, correlates the two and creates Pareto charts. And now we're arguing with data, real data. Uh, and, you know, seeing whether or not people have failed login attempts or, uh, or, or what have you. And so it just, it, it leads to better outcomes and better decisions. Um, you know, data, it, it, there's a, there's always an art and a science. And, you know, as a media company, I'm sure you're pretty aware of AB testing. You know, that's a big step, but companies can get too stuck in that AB land and you'll reach sort of diminishing returns at some point, at which point you need to go to the art part and not just the science part. And, and, you know, if you don't have that data to make those informed decisions, the art and the science, the art part is going to be poor. You know, just thinking you're going to make worse decisions. Then, you know, the, the other key thing is, you know, things are getting more volatile and certain complex. The, the whole notion of VUCA, uh, that's increasing. And so data is a nice counterbalance to that. Being able to have you know, near real-time data from key systems to be able to iterate and adjust to you know, rapidly changing environments and so forth is, is key. What do you think that CIOs, like right now, what should be their kind of thought process going into 2020, thinking about you know, business intelligence, how they should you know, prepare for you know, data being increasing in complexity, increasing in importance, and how to structure potentially their teams or just look at making investments? 
Yeah. So I, that's a great question. And what I'd say is, look, you know, I, I correlate it to, you know, in prior years participated in fantasy football and the, the, the person who always won fantasy football was the commissioner. Yeah. Now and you're why the commissioner always win. <laughs> the, the commissioner always wins because they're closest to the data. Uh, and so what happens is you have these, you know, BI teams uh, and they do all of this analysis uh, and they really know what's going on. And then somewhere else in your organization, you got a developer working on a feature that's related and they're starting from scratch. And so one of the nice things about click technology is it's, you know, API capabilities and the embedded capabilities where, you know, this, that BI team can get the developer halfway downfield or to the 20 yard line. So then now the developer saying, ah, okay, I'm tapping into all of that awesome institutional knowledge. And so we've got customers like Spotify, Intuit, and Cisco that embed our technology into their products. So now all of a sudden they're not doing all that rework. So as a CIO, I'd say, look, look at your BI team as the fantasy football commissioner and tap into that so that you can extend that into your products. So word on the street is that you have a patent. Can you share that? Yes. Yeah. So, um, that's a uh, intrusion detection system for consumer electronics. Uh, and so, you know, that came from creating an intrusion detection system for cable boxes, uh, but that then applies to consumer electronics. If you're tinkering around, you're going to trip on something and it's going to set a flag and then it's going to disable whatever device you're working on. So that was a long process. The patent application process took a long time. So yeah, what was your, why, why were you working on this? Was this like for one of the companies you were working for? Was it just like, you know, side project? No, it was, it was directly for the, uh, you know, Xfinity cable box. And so people open the box and start tinkering around that then, you know, creates trouble. And so we wanted to be able to know if anybody's messing around with the, with the box or trying to install software or anything like that. So does it say your name? <laughs> the patent does for sure. I wanted to ask um, if you have any kind of like AI or machine learning or anything like that. I don't know if you actually do you have any thoughts on that stuff. Yeah. So look, I, I think that, um, you know, AI for sure is a big, big thing right now. And, and our position as, as a company is the notion of augmented intelligence. Now I personally believe in that because if you look at, let's say the, the you know, chess championships, the, Computer can beat the grandmaster now, and that's been going on for a while, but they have these competitions where it's open forums, and it can be computer and human, and the computer and human always win. And so that's our posture as a company as well with, with cognitive uh, intelligence. And so as it relates to data, machine learning and AI can absorb and look and interpret data a hell of a lot better than a human can. And so our product recommends charts and helps you figure out from a, a set of data, you know, what's important. And then also just the notion of, you know, I would imagine most listeners here when they have analysis, they're looking at, you know, from today back year trends, week over week and all that other stuff. Now what you're starting to see is projections forward, projections forward using machine learning, using AI is pretty cool. And, and the thing that I'm just blown away with personally is things that seemingly were unknowable in the past, like weather, traffic, even fantasy football. You know, you look at this and, and, and now computers can guess pretty darn well what the traffic's going to be wherever you're going or what any particular player, how many touchdowns they're going to throw. And, and for the most part, they're right. We need to do an IT Visionaries uh, uh, fantasy football listener league. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Okay, so let's get into the lightning round. All right. These questions are fast and easy, just like the Salesforce platform. You can go to salesforce.com to learn more about the Salesforce platform. We love them. You can go to salesforce.com slash build mobile apps to learn more about building mobile apps, fast and easy on the world's number one CRM. Lightning round questions. Sean, are you ready? Yes, let's do it. Number one, what app on your phone is the most fun? Uh, so I'm going to answer that with two things that I'm looking at. So one, I, I'm using Medium, which is just a great way to consume content. And uh, it's just interesting articles that are that are, plenty of technologies are publishing it there. But then I'm also looking at a, a product where we've got called Happy Signals, which is uh, an internal net promoter score. So it's a plug-in for ServiceNow where... 
somebody ha has a request, they get a net, net promoter score survey and then it gives feedback. And so it's just a great way to get a pulse of what's going on far and wide throughout my company. That's really cool. Yeah, that's super interesting. What is your favorite city that you've lived in? So I'm a New Yorker at heart. You know, if you're from New York, New York's the, the, the city. It's, if you're even around the area, you say the city. Uh, so New York, for sure. Favorite team? Unfortunately, the New York Jets. Oh, my goodness. That is that's <laughs> rough. That is rough. Do you have a favorite book or podcast that you've read or listened to recently? Yeah. So um, in terms of books, I'm a big fan right now of uh, it's called Automate the Boring Stuff. So it's a bunch of Python scripts to automate tasks in Excel and scrape websites and all that stuff. So that uh, keeps my tech chops real and uh, helps me get some productivity. So that's pretty cool. And then podcasts. Uh, yeah, I, this is one of my favorite. It's, it's this and the uh, Andreessen Horowitz uh, podcast. This one for hearing stories from people like Alvina and John Davis at the you know, Cyber Command and, and the wearables is just pretty cool to hear about. And then the Andreessen piece is just hearing about cool new companies that I want to go check out. Favorite thing to cook or eat? Ice cream. Which cheesesteak shop Gino's. do you go to? Gina's, all right. What do you do for fun? Technology. Uh, it's my passion. And so I, I develop, I code every day. And it's a way for me to get my mind out of whatever's going on and just sort of, it's almost meditative. You sort of get into the zone and start thinking about you know, nothing but whatever you're doing. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experience, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform.